Welcome everyone to the Astronomical Society of Edinburgh, um, to our second meeting in May. And tonight we have a very interesting study to talk about Indigenous Australian astronomy from Dr. Pete Kuzma, who we have on the chat uh, with us here. Um, I've just got a few slides uh, before we get into the main talk, um, just uh, about a few things in the society for members and one or two other bits and pieces as well. So this is what we've got coming up. Um, I've got some news items, um, the talks that are coming soon, and the main talks as well, main talk as well. At the end, we have something for ASC members only, which um, visitors will not be interested in in the slightest. It's about changes to our constitution. So I will turn off YouTube then just so as not to subject you to, to the boredom, but um, you're welcome to the rest of the meeting, certainly. For members, um, we have our AGM on the 2nd of June, and we're going to have a quite a significant um, special general meeting as well. We've all been sent to paperwork, so please have a look at that and um, please plan to be there because we need enough people to be there to actually um, make some meaningful changes to the constitution. On our website, there's a, there's a nice article that, that Ramsey McIver has, has just written for us about noctilucent clouds. We're approaching noctilucent cloud season towards the end of May, maybe the beginning of June as well. And these are really, really beautiful objects. So have a look at, at that article and I'll tell you what to look for and what they actually are. Very interesting. And we have uh, one new member um, this month. That's Mike Newton. I don't know if Mike's on tonight, but um, let's welcome Mike in the usual way. Um, can't see anyone here tonight. I think he was playing golf, that's why. Um, so I just thought I'd bring up a few pictures on a Flickr group, the, the recent ones. Um, this is a, a really nice um, picture of the sun in hydrogen alpha by Robert Arnold. Uh, he's one of our um, remote members in Sky, I think. Um, that's really a nice image. This one from Bill Bonner, um, the Elephant's Trunk Nebula. Um, you, you did that just, just the other night. That's a really nice false color image um, that he's taken. This is one of mine, a uh, recent one of the sun. The sun's um, quite an active year so far. Um, the last, um, give me a minute. Um, yeah, it's been really quite active, but the last last month's not been that great, but um, it's starting to get active again. Some nice new spots on the sun showing up. And this was quite an interesting um, effect that happened the other the other day that um, someone pointed out and a lot of us caught is a 22 degree sun halo, and that's formed by sunlight, mm -hmm. in this case, uh, being refracted off millions of hexagonal ice crystals, and it makes a, a really quite a nice effect. This was in the, in the middle of the day, but rather, rather a nice object there. Sadly, there are other things in the sky that are not so nice. So last night I was out uh, looking up and a whole trail of Starlink satellites um, polluting the sky. Um, you can see the, the, the streaks of them over there that I caught and Pat caught. And there's, there's a, a video here of um, them streaking across the sky. There are now very many thousands of these things with many more thousands planned. Um, so it's making life very difficult for us. So it's quite interesting to see these satellites, but the um, knock-on effect is very significant and it's not something I particularly want to see in the sky. Stopping. You can stay in touch with us in various ways. Our website has everything on it that, that we're doing, lots of all the events, all the news items. Um, we have a really full YouTube channel of all the talks we've had in the past, and this talk will be on there afterwards as well. You can see all the images taken by our members on our Flickr group as well, and there's some amazing images there. These are the talks that are coming up soon. Um, the next one on the 2nd of June <coughs> is from our honorary president, Professor Andy Lawrence, about 200 years of astronomical imaging from the Royal Observatory Edinburgh. That should be a, a, a really good one. <coughs> the Sky Night magazine picked that one up and decided to 
use it as their talk pick of the month for next month. So uh, maybe we'll get a few more visitors that way. And as I said, we have our AGM and SGM at the end of that meeting as well for the members. On the 7th of June, sorry, that, that meeting will be hybrid. So it'll be in person in Edinburgh or the Augusta United Church on George the Fourth Bridge, also on Zoom for members and on YouTube for visitors. The 7th of June is our Imaging and Observing Group. That's for members only and that will be on Zoom. And on the 16th of June, a traveler's guide to the stars. And that's uh, an online only meeting in the same way that this one is on Zoom for members and YouTube for visitors. 7th of July, we have a talk from Dr. Pamela Classen about um, the James Webb Space Telescope from Launch to First Science. That will be a hybrid meeting again in Edinburgh and online. And uh, the, the final talk before our August break is on the 21st of July, which um, we've just put in today, which is an astronomer's guide to the chemical elements. That sounds an interesting one as well. So we have uh, a month off and then we'll be back on the 1st of September. And we haven't got the talk planned for that yet. Okay, well, that's it from us. Um, I'm going to stop sharing um, now and hand over to Dr. Pete Kuzma, who's going to tell us about Indigenous Australian astronomy. Over to you, Pete. All right. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much uh, for having me here today. Uh, it is, uh, it's pretty cool to uh, be talking to the Royal Society of Edinburgh, having lived in Edinburgh now for five years my, myself. Um, I was, uh, this, this talk here, for some little background, is something I've just, um, something that's been close to my heart over the past couple of years, as, uh, as we've started to see a lot of uh, growth in, um, in Indigenous astronomy in Australia over the past decade or so. We're going to get into that um, towards the end. Uh, of this talk. But uh, just a, a couple of things to kick us off. This is not going to be your standard uh, astronomy talk where you only hear about clusters and spectral lines and all that kind of stuff. This is going to be more of an exploration. I'm going to share more about what, um, a bit more about, more like an anthropological view of uh, Indigenous Australians and uh, their connections to the, to the sky, to the night sky. And we're going to be touching on the land as well because it is all intertwined. Uh, for the indigenous populations of Australia, but um, when we when we say indigenous populations, we typically uh, refer to two major groups, and that's the indigenous population and uh, and the Torres Strait Islander uh, population as well. And these flags here uh, have a re relatively recent adaptations, 1995, when a lot of these were considered were adopted to be official representations of these groups of people, the the nations of Australia. And uh, they, so these these flags do mean something to uh, to these to the to the nations. Like on the, the indigenous flag on the left here, the yellow circle referring to the sun, the black referring to the uh, to the indigenous populations of the mainland of Australia, and red corresponding to the color of the sand, the ochre around Australia. As for Torres Strait Islanders here, the green representing the land of the islands, the blue the water, the black stripes indicating the represents the the peoples as well uh the horseshoe shape thing there is a headdress and uh the five pointed star in the middle corresponds to the to the main five islands around the Torres Strait so it's this kind of uh, this this is a good way to introduce the concept of how how uh connected to the land uh they are but to give you a brief uh a brief history uh, the expectation is that we think that the indigenous populations arrived into Sahul from Sunda um, some 45 to 65,000 years ago in the, in the Pleistocene era. And so this is the indigenous populations of Australia, one of the most, if not the longest continuous running uh, civilization or group of humans in the world. And they, uh, when they crossed over from Southeast Asia into Sahul at the time, uh, of course, uh, the uh, Indonesia and Papua New Guinea there was connected to the mainland, as was Tasmania. So when they crossed over, this map here kind of gives you an idea of how we think they migrated across the country and how long it took them uh, to do so. And so they may have arrived 45, 65 million years ago, but it only took them around 5,000 years to kind of populate all over Australia and New Guinea up and uh, Torres Straits up. Uh, in between the tip of Australia on the right, Queensland, and, uh, and 
New Guinea over there. And so with, you would expect that this map shows that they did go all around the outside of Australia, but they do make it into the middle. And in fact, at its peak, there were over 500 nations in mainland Australia and in Tasmania. So the whole country can be split up into each of these individual nations. And for those of you uh, who are interested where some astronomical sites are uh, in Australia, in Western Australia, you may know of the Square Kilometre Pathfinder Telescope, or ASCAP, and uh, Square Kilometre Rating, stuff like that, uh, are based roughly in this area. I don't know if you can see my mouse cursor, but where the star is on the left, and that is that, that land belongs to the Wajatari people. And on the east side of Australia, some of you may know the Siding Springs Observatory, which is in uh, Kilmoroy, uh, the Parks Radio Telescope, it's uh, in central New South Wales there, but that belongs that land uh, belongs to the Wiradjuri people. And Canberra, where I'm from, where Mount Stromlo Observatory is and the Canberra Deep Space Communication Complex, uh, it is uh, part of the Ngunnawal uh, nation. And so it is now customary in Australian astronomy when you use these instruments. If you're going to publish any work on it, um, it is customary for now to acknowledge the true custodians of the land that. Uh, that the telescope is currently on, and we attribute these works to the elders of those lands. But this map may show, you know, five hundred odd nations. Um, you can extend the indigenous populations of Australia. They weren't, they weren't a writing. They didn't write things down. Of course, they were very oral. There's a strong oral tradition. Uh, through everything, through spoken words, through songs, through dance, through art, and a lot of the information, a lot of their uh, rituals, their, their religion, their way of life was passed down through an oral tradition. And this is what we're going to be focusing on today. What I want to share with you is how the indigenous populations of Australia were able to make sense of the world around them. What was the type of stories or dreaming that they would share? Uh, did they, and many uh, similarities potentially with modern day astronomy and uh, what kind of conclusions that their stories kind of lent uh, about the world around them. So despite there being 500 or so nations, there are similar beliefs across them. Some of them in different parts of Australia will be significantly different, but in most cases, they tend to all follow the same uh, interpretation of the world around them. And this, this image just here is a, one of the creator spirits in Indigenous astronomy, the rainbow serpent. Uh, and in particularly in the northern parts of Australia, this is the one that br brought life uh, to, uh, to Australia or to the land from the sky. And the, the, the rainbow serpent will pop up you know, a little bit uh, later uh, down the track. So when it comes to uh, understanding the indigenous populations and their connections to the land and the sky and the water around them is they uh, believed in something which, which we've kind of adopted in an anthropological term as the dreaming, which could be called as oral traditions, it could be told as stories. Um, there's a lot of terms in my, line of, in my language that are mostly uh, introductions from the Western world and may not be the appropriate terms to be used. And I am trying my best now to, I've been trying to get out of these bad habits of using particular words and phrase out of respect to the indigenous populations of Australia. So uh, I will hopefully will avoid some of these traps. But the dreaming is what I want to, is what we're going to be focusing on. This is where, this is what we call where, they, where all their stories take place, pretty much. And we are going to look at some of the closer astronomical bodies and then move uh, further out. So let's start with the most uh, important one of them all, you might say, the sun. I mean, it is a is typically a creator spirit, and that's probably not a surprise. I mean, it is the thing that gives us light, it gives us warmth, it gives us heat. Uh, it is the beginning of the day, of course. Uh, there would be no surprise that it plays a very strong part in Indigenous astronomy. And across the land, across all the nations in Australia, the sun is a woman. Uh, that is a common place and, uh, for, it, uh, for, for it to be described. 
And the dreaming can can explain the motion of the sun across the sky. Can, they they have described the way the sun is lit up, the way the sun provides heat. And I'm going to be sharing a couple of those stories uh, with you today. Uh, and um, these are specifically of the uh, Gilomnu, which are based in Queensland, Southeast Queensland, I believe, and the Kalia tribe, uh, Kalia nation, sorry, which I believe is in Northern Territory, uh, Australia. And we'll start, I'll, let you, I'll start with the Yolngu tradition of the story known, of the sun woman known as Walu. So Walu, as someone, as the sun woman, it's her that prevent, who wants to give, uh, who has a journey that she likes to create. Uh, she likes to go on every day. She, in the morning, when it's still dark, she will get up and search for twigs and branches and flint to be able to create a fire. And that lighting of the fire produces the light of dawn. She covers herself in the typical red sand or ochre of central Australia. And this kind of flecks off and falls onto the clouds and onto the sky, which corresponds to the reddish pinkish hues that you see during the dawn. As the sun rises, Walu is picking up a torch that she has taken from her bonfire and starts to travel across the sky from east to west providing light, heat, as she travels, traverses across the sky. Towards the end of the day, as she gets towards the west side uh, of the land, as her reddish sand that she's put on her body starts to fleck off, again presenting the pinkish hues you may see around sunset, and then she puts out her torch as she gets to the west side, and hence prevent, and hence she does the same thing again the next day, presenting how she is the one that provides light and heat for everyone below. And this is a common this is a common story. This is a common tradition. Uh, but there's also tribes that are more connected to the to the animals around them, and like the Kulila tribe, the Kulila tribe, sorry. And the story of Dinawan and Bragola goes as follows: These two beautiful birds were were playing around until. One got a bit aggravated, the emu got a bit aggravated and kicked one of Bregola's eggs. At the time, the world was mostly in darkness. And the one thing that I haven't mentioned quite yet, which I'll just throw in here, that a common, a common belief in, uh, in the dreaming is that the earth is a reflection of the sky. The sky is land as well. So when, when Dinawan kicked the egg, of the, of the dancing bird into the sky, the egg landed on a pyre, landed on a bunch of wooden twig, wooden, wooden sticks, and cracked open. And the yolk in that egg caught a light, and caught, and so thus drenched the land below, the earth, in light. And there was a creator spirit who thought the world looked much better in the light and the warmth that uh, that was being provided by this cracked egg fire. So every day, this spirit decides it's now time. Every day, we're going to crack open an egg and light on fire for the world to see. And we will send the morning star as an indication that the sun is about to rise. Well, that the light, the fire is about to be lit, I should say. But there was an issue with this, that people people were typically, men, would be sleeping during this time and they would not see the morning star. And thus, this creator spirit sent a kookaburra as a way of waking everyone up to say the day is starting. It's a very lovely story in these two, two different ways of interpreting the world around them, all from not too far differently geographically, as it is quite interesting. But then when you have the sun, there's the counter, uh, there's the counter one, the moon, of course, another one who plays a very big part in indigenous astronomy. Uh, no surprise it being a, uh, a center point. It too is a creative spirit, and uh, it is typically represented as a man, an evil man, really. And the the dream, the dreaming, does has a very good. Have, there are dreaming stories out there that explain different things that we see about the moon, the causing of the tides, the phases, the waxing and waning uh, of the moon, and those are particularly. Uh, these are particularly interesting too, and I'll, I'll share a couple of stories again from the Lognu tribe, um, 
the Longu tribe believed that the moon was a jolly fat man. Not very jolly, really. Pretty, pretty rude. When he was full, when the moon was full, uh, the Galindi, the Galindi was uh, very selfish. And even though he was full, he was too lazy to go out and hunt for himself. So he got his wives and his sons to go out and hunt for him. But this made them very frustrated. So they would chip away at him with an axe. This was this was the phase shifting in, and eventually he would become so thin that he would fall out of the sky, hence the new moon. Eventually, he would regain the strength to get back up into the sky, and thus beginning the phases of the moon again, and slowly gorge himself on food to become fat again. And this continues over and over. This explains the motions and the phases of the moon and the skies for these people, for this nation. And an additional kind of uh, bitter addition to this story is that the moon got very angry at this and decided that death may now come to people. Before this time, it was all uh, people were uh, immortal, but as the moon was very cranky about being kicked out of the sky in the way he did and thus caused mortals to appear. And this idea of the moon uh, being evil, bitter, bringing death, or cause, being the cause of death uh, in indigenous culture um, is shared in other tribes. It is somewhat common in that the Ulele tribe, Balu, uh, had uh, they, that, that nation believed that the moon asked man who had been newly born to help ferry his dogs across a river. And then the man refused. So Balu decided, you know what? Have some snakes. And uh, therefore, you will you you now can be killed and the snakes will kill you. And so this kind of helps also put in a tradition of killing snakes and getting, being all gone away from poisonous snakes in the outback of Australia. And the one thing else I did mention, the tides, right? the the Longu people uh, believed one of the traditions in the area that was slightly different to the one I previously described, believed that the moon was transferring water uh, into the ocean, into the seas around it, thus presenting the tribes. When the moon was full, there was more water around. And as the phase has changed, and the moon either dumped water or took water away, the tides would fall in and out. So there was, they were making the connection between the sizes and the phases of the moon and the water around them. And this is the Torres Strait Islanders had similar, could make similar connections that the moon was doing this. The moon was the cause of the tides. Now, as, as for eclipses, the First Nations appeared to understand what an eclipse was in the dreaming, both solar and, and uh, lunar. And uh, the solar eclipses were typically uh, considered a bad omen. These kind of once-off only events um, were considered bad omens. And some tribes would explain that it is the sun capturing uh, the moon for all of his bad deeds. As for the lunar eclipse more, as being more frequent, they were still considered to be uh, bad omens linked to death. Of course, or in some in some uh, nations, the moon is trying to hide from the sun because or because the sun is trying to capture the moon for all of its bad deeds. But it's interesting that they were, despite maybe these two differently linked instructional events, this, they were still shown that these objects were together creating the events that we're seeing. And when it is some other interesting facts, when you're thinking about the sun and some of these stories, there is some implication that they that they believed in the stories that they told that the earth was not infinite in size, that it was finite. And the the story that I described about Walu, the sun woman, she that story continues to suggest that she goes under the earth, picking up sticks and bark to create the fire that she's going to light from the torch. Um, further down the line, at the, on the uh, on the east coast, so that would imply that the where the place they lived was a finite length, not necessarily a globe, but was finite in length. And I mentioned this earlier, but the Earth and the sky to be considered as reflections kind of 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 each other. Um, 
the nights and stars in the sky in some nations were reflections of huts, of campfires that were reflecting what was on the ground. The Milky Way itself, a river with huts lined along it with their own campfires. It's this, it, it's a, such a poetic and nice way to describe the world around them. But when you, you want, one, one thing when you look at the stars, if you look at the sky long enough, the most astute observers will notice there's a bunch of stars that don't travel like the rest and they don't look uh, like the rest. So it is no surprise that there would be stories and uh, dreaming about the, the planets that you can see with the naked eye. And it, it's, it seems that they, that tribes were able to, uh, sorry, nations were able to understand the ecliptic or the zodiac, whatever the way you want to talk about it, um, uh, the passage of planets across the sky. And they were typically known, they knew, they were regular enough that the, the nations knew uh, each individual object um, out, of the, you know, out of Mars, Venus, Mercury, Jupiter, and Saturn. And the 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 non flickering nature of planets in the night sky, unlike stars, uh, gave a lot of these objects uh, the sense that they were wandering spirits. They were traveling across a road in the sky, always across the same path. And the solid lights was the way that you could pick them out with respect to the rest, just there, always watching. Um, but you may not be surprised to learn that Venus was the most pop was uh, pretty much a very popular one in the dreaming. Uh, there are some nations who uh, consider the morning star and the evening star to be different, but complementary, life and death uh, kind of thing. Um, sorry, but uh, there's, there, is, there are evidence to suggest that some nations could connect that the evening and the morning star were in fact the same object. And again, using the Longnu tribe, Longnu nation here, sorry, as an example, um, they believed, or their story of the evening star corresponded to a celebration of the creator spirit that Venus is. So Venus uh, was a spirit that helped in their in their uh, in their dreaming, helped direct man to Australia, and she was able to fly across the land uh kind of organizing up to see which nations would have different parts who could fish where who could who could gather in these locations and the path that she took across the sky uh, across australia is is corresponds to like a trade route across the northern end of australia across the top end so she's very very important to the ogni tribe but when when the evening star was at a particular point in the sky the the only tribe would start a celebration in in the name of Banuvia, and some four hundred or so days later, they would have a fel a feast, a celebration that would go all night to celebrate the rising of Branuva in the morning. And this was a part where people believed that spirits could leave Earth, directed by Bunambia you know, towards the spirit world, and. They were connected to, they could travel to Venus via a spear or a pole connected to it. And the fear, the, uh, the understanding of this is that what you're actually seeing is this kind of uh, zodiacal light that happens where the dust is lit up before dawn. And the indigenous populations connected that as kind of uh, uh, a kind of pole to, or a rope to connect to the evening star. And there's, there's a, another nice little uh, common theory that when Venus was quite low in the atmosphere and was no longer flickering, or was no longer solid light, it was flickering because of the turbulence of the atmosphere, it looked like a jolly fat man laughing, which is just a nice little, uh, <laughs> nice little anecdote there. Now, as for the other planets, it's pretty rare uh, to see, to have uh, any accounts uh, from them. Um, Mercury, the uh, one that I could find that was consistent in my research was typically considered to be the daughter of the sun. And as she was never found too far away from the sun woman, uh, the typical dreaming story is that she is hiding uh, from the moon who is trying to abduct her in some way. Uh, Mars, uh, the typical red 
uh, view of Mars was very strong. Um, you know, combat again was uh, combat was kind of popular with this one. Um, of uh, warriors covered in the typical red ochre seems to be commonplace in Indigenous astronomy. Jupiter was has more than a, as seems that all the ranchers could uncover is that it was just a wandering spirit always watching it was they could sit in the sky for a very long time and slowly traverse the night sky um so it would uh be the one that would always be there it would always just just be watching just doing its its own thing and the stories about saturn were even rarer but i did find a very nice very short one from the central desert people who uh say saturn was the brother of venus and searches food for their searches for food with their dog jupiter across the ecliptic in the sky so a lot of these stories, all these dreaming, I should say, have been told to uh, to astronomers, to specifically white astronomers who are looking to, to perform this kind of research to give them a voice. So um, a lot of the, a lot of things that I'm showing you today were delivered uh, in a very ritualistic sense, and so this is you may be seeing a lot of similar names popping up. Is because those are the tribes who've been willing to speak. Uh, to it, and we'll, we'll touch on that a bit further along. But I just wanted to throw that out there. Now, as for meters, comets, and craters, you can consider comets and meteors to be a uh, a random event, and thus, you guessed it, kind of a bad omen to appear. Uh, but there was no real strong evidence to suggest uh, nations could really tell a difference between the two. Um, there's very little comments to be made about that. But there are some local impact craters uh, that were uh, very important uh, to, to local nations. So uh, the story here, so on the left, the Trenorola, uh, Trenorola sorry, uh, the Grossus Bluff crater in uh, Northern Territory is a sacred site of a lost child. So the, the, uh, the dreaming goes with this one. There were two parents, uh, the evening star and the morning star. Uh, had a child that they that they dropped from the sky onto earth and fell and created this crater and every evening every time the evening star is up or the morning star is up they are looking for their lost child this site is very sacred and so a lot a lot of the nearby tribe uh, nations do not go into this location and the same with the one on the right uh come to malau from the, oh, the wolf creek crater and it appears the, the tip the, the the dreaming of around this one is the evening star fell to the ground, creating a big storm of fire and uh fire falling rocks. So a lot of uh so this is a it kind of brings in the idea of understanding a impact that or oh, what may happen during an impact. Though this crater is 300,000 years old. Uh, I think the last time I heard there was dated that far back. So it's unlikely that the indigenous populations uh, were there to see it fall. But it's interesting that they kind of arrived to that conclusion. I mean, as, as for comets, um, the one story I found that it can be used very much as, as personal gain, um, as well as uh, the pretty nature of the tales of comets uh, led, we reckon, led to the origin of the rainbow serpent um halley specifically is the comet they think may uh be related to the origins of the rainbow serpent which is interesting if you consider um the fact that comets in our common in our modern day astronomy may be one of the reasons there's life on this planet bringing water uh with it to a lot of impacts into earth so some first nations arrived at the same idea that comets brought life to uh to the earth and as I was just briefly mentioning, getting my words mixed up, um, there's a there's a quite a funny story I think of uh, people using comets to uh, for personal gain. So the image here on the left, you could see the tail looking quite kind of streaky across the sky, and local populations considered those to be spears that could be raining down onto onto the planet at any moment. And so one local man uh, believed that he could. He said that he had magical medicine that would ward off any spears that would fall to the ground. And he uh, he, he went out every day with his magical rocks to kind of demonstrate that he would protect everyone. And the spears kind of 
would fall away as time went by, as the comet would leave, and was then presented a hero. As far as other like one-off astronomical events are concerned, uh, there seems to be a correlation between when the stories of a new of um, the wife of Wa, which is a uh, just a local uh, creator spirit, uh, appeared around eight, what would be about 1840, which is I think is about the time Eta Carina went off. And subsequently, Eta, uh, the story died off at roughly the same rate as uh, Eta Carina's uh, light curve did. So there's this interesting correspondence uh, between uh, Eta Carina, but it, um, there's nothing else that we can really see between individual events like supernovae. This is mostly because we think that because they happened so quickly that they were probably seen as a bad omen, but then never, nothing had happened, so they didn't talk about it again. The LMC and the SMC, the small large magellanic clouds, appear to be just huts of local uh, of uh, creator spirits, uh, old creator spirits are being uh, having the stars around them as their sons and daughters hunting for them. And it's uh, the front, like the more typical things you may associate with uh, with uh, early astronomy using rock formations and land formations to keep track of uh, the seasons. There's evidence that the indigenous populations did that, but it's uh, not just uh, land marks, uh, list, uh, constellations in the sky were also uh, very important to them. You could use them to track when it's time to hunt, when it's time to fish. Um, and it's not just the space, not just drawing lines between stars, even the dark space in between those stars were also used uh, to describe, uh, were also used in their dreaming. So the most popular one, uh, some of you may have heard of this one. Uh, if you look here on the left, you may recognize this as the uh, just the Milky Way across the southern sky uh, with the Colsac Nebula up here at the top right. This is a very important uh one of the most very important dreaming it's a very common one of those common uh dreaming stories out there if you can't see what this is supposed to be it is an emu this is the great emu in the sky where it's the dust clouds across the milky way i'm create uh demonstrating the emu with its head as the cold second nebula and when the emu is rising, when it looks like it's sitting on the horizon, it means it's laid its eggs, it's time to go hunt its eggs. And as its head, if it's looking like it's diving towards the horizon, it's time to go hunt the animal itself. I mean, the great emu in the sky is, is very, very, very common. There's a couple of stories about the emu in the sky that I would like to share. Um, there's the one where this, uh, a man was trying to hunt uh, an emu got a bit. This gentleman got a little bit too uh, too ambitious and fell in a combat to the emu, and the wife of the husband banished the emu to the sky forever. Uh, that is a common story. And then there's uh, another one, the Burong people, which uses the emu and the Southern Cross, which is here on the right, the head of the emu, with which uh, is known as the ringtail possum in the Bororong tradition. And the way this story goes is that there were two hunters that were out to prove that they can hunt, two brothers. But when they saw the giant emu, one of the brothers got, got so scared and climbed a tree. And the, boy, the brother that wasn't scared was appalled by his brother's cowardice. But after he slayed the emu and placed the emu in the sky, he turned his brother into a ringtail possum in a tree and put him above the emu's head, for he would forever be taunted by the emu that he was too afraid to strike. Uh, Orion is pretty popular. Uh, as you think, from my point of view, he looks upside down from the south, right in the north, point right way up. You'll be glad to know that he's seen as a bunch of boys, a bunch of hunters, maybe even fishing, um, with three lads uh, fishing, with the sword of Orion being you know, the fish. But uh, in the Kolkambula, um, Kolkambula is the name of the two lads from the Bororong people that are just like to dance, they like to hunt, and they we trying to chase down and persuade uh, the seven sisters or the Pleiades to join them. 
So is the the wrong people, and it's a, it's common to see the seven sisters or the Pleiades be women and Orion to be related to men uh, in across all the nations in Australia. Now that might seem a bit familiar. Um, you see, in Greek, if you think about modern Greek mythology, you know, Orion is male, Pleiades are female. Orion's chasing them, and uh, the Pleiades are also known as seven sisters. Though even though under even the most perfect night sky, you're probably not going to see seven stars. So two different similar, two different civilizations, two different times, but similar stories. And a couple of other examples, uh, you have the red kangaroo. When it's coming up, it's time to go hunt them. Uh, the red the red rump parrot. Uh, this one, again, when it was up, you go hunt to go get its eggs, similar with the jackie lizard. And uh, the fantail, oh, to the long neck tortoise again. Uh, when they're all coming up on the horizon, it is time to go, uh, go hunting and gathering for these. Now, a lot of these pictures are from the program Stellarium, if you've heard of Stellarium. Um, on this program, they have all of the uh, constellations from the Boorong people. So there's a lot more than this. And if you want to have a look, I would highly suggest looking there uh, using that program. Um, the night sky has also been used as tradition or song lines because they didn't have maps. They would transmit navigational techniques through song, through dance. And so there are a lot of roads in Australia that follow ancient uh, nation uh, songs that would then be linked to tracks or, or constellations in the sky. For example, I think Scorpius here is linked to a, it's very similar to a highway in Australia. In fact, a lot of the highways in Australia are, were created most likely through local populations leading the settlers through these paths and thus creating the local highways that you'll see today. I think it's a very interesting thing uh, that uh, the indigenous populations could navigate through song. And a lot of these songs are also connected to creative spirits as well. Now, um, I'm going to just comment now in the last five, 10 minutes or so that I have on what's happening now. So a lot of these stories are very, a lot of these stories of the dreaming uh, has come from, like I mentioned earlier, from people who were willing to talk. Uh, to the astronomers that go out to appreciate them, but like we cannot understand, we cannot underestimate the effect the colonization had on the first peoples of Australia. And what this figure here uh, on the right demonstrates the amount of cited papers in astronomy uh, on Indigenous astronomy per decade. And you can see for the longest time there were less than ten a year, but over the past 10, 20, 30 years or so, we've started to rectify that, and we're starting to see more emphasis on Indigenous astronomy in Australia, uh, talking to elders uh, that who are willing to talk to us. Uh, we're looking at um, increasing STEM opportunities for those uh, who wouldn't normally have those opportunities. And we're starting now to see the fruits of this labour. And so there are, I want to bring up the work of two postgraduate students. I'm pretty sure they're still postgraduate students. Maybe they've graduated now. I have to reach out to them. But Carly Noon and Peter Swanton are doing great things to bring Indigenous Australia, Indigenous astronomy to the populace and bringing astronomy to uh, Indigenous Australian communities. Um, they have done an, an online on YouTube uh, undergraduate course on Indigenous astronomy. Uh, Peter is trying to protect uh, the dark skies by, by uh, researching the effect of light pollution on uh, on indigenous populations, because as soon as you, the light pollution creeps in, it's going to lose the connection of the indigenous populations have to the sky if you can't see these things anymore. So it is fantastic work that Peter is doing. Kylie is writing many books uh, at different and different age groups of, of indigenous astronomy, and she's developing. She may even be developed now because the last time I chatted to her was last year, uh, but including indigenous and teaching the indigenous knowledge into the national school curriculum in Australia, something which was not taught for me and hence why I'm trying to like kick out certain words that I learned growing up that are just, just completely uh, disrespectful. But it's it's really great that uh, what Kylie and Peter are doing are setting the groundwork for the increased number of Indigenous Australians that are doing STEM or even just getting into education, which is really, really great to see. 
So uh, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, to talk to you all today and sharing the stories of the Indigenous populations of Australia. There is, they are, the, the material is out there. You can Google it. Uh, Ray Norris was particularly prevalent in writing a lot of papers uh, on these topics about different uh, facets of Indigenous astronomy. So I highly recommend checking out Ray Norris's work, but some Googling should get some uh, Indigenous Australian information if you are interested. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to chat about it now. And we thank Pete for his talk before we move on to questions, because that was really fascinating. Thank you. Yeah, as you say, not, not a standard astronomy talk that we get, but we really love these sort of slightly um, di di different talks. We had, mm. had a few recently. It really does add, add to the, the colour of the talks that we get. That's really, really great. Um, Peter, have you got anything on, on um, Zoom chat? Francis earlier was asking if he could explain the term the dreaming a bit more. I know Nigel's posted a link, but uh, it would be interesting to understand what the dreaming is a bit better. Right, so uh, to my understanding, you can think of the dreaming more as a, a concept of religion in a way. It is a land where all of the spirits live. And it is their way of... It is in this environment of the dreaming that can explain that everything that has happened around them. Um, this, this this connects to the idea of the earth and the sky being two reflections of each other. So a lot of the dreaming uh, could theoretically take place in the sky world, where a lot where all of the creative spirits live. Um, you, you, you think it more. <laughs> I don't want to use something like imaginary, but it's, it's that kind of concept. But consider it more uh more spirit a lot more spiritually led because this these kind of stories will interweave dance festivals art uh that bring together whole communities uh so think of it as it's ever as i guess kind of like a religion i suppose but a very fundamental one to each nation uh across uh torres strait and the mainland of australia Right. Thank, thank does, the concept, does the concept of the dreaming vary across the country? Are there regional variations? So there are regional variations. And it, the, the dreaming is, I should say, an anthological term that's given to try and put everything under one solid umbrella for all of us to understand. It's not more nuanced than that, uh, I believe. And I can't really say much more than that because... Uh, I haven't specifically researched these things myself and thought of these papers that have come out to try and approach the topic respectfully, that this term dreaming, um, just it is something that Western civilizations have applied to, to try and comprehend exactly the connections that, and the stories that they're sharing and the environment that all that takes, in, takes place in. Thank you. Thank you for that. Nigel, you had a question. Uh, yes, I did. Uh, thanks very much, Pete. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, my question was regarding uh, the various nations, uh, whether they had different constellation patterns bet between the nations, given that uh, the, the Torres Strait Islanders and, say, for instance, the nations that uh, are in Tasmania, that there's quite a, a difference in latitude. Mm. Um, so did, did they have different... Um, ideas about uh, groups of stars and, and how they saw them? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Uh, there's really not much else that can really be said on it. Unfortunately, this is this is one of those things that uh, I think plays into the fact that we haven't, we've only really started to scratch the surface uh, of, of all this. But uh, for the tri for the nations, sorry, not tribes, tribes, bad. Nations are the right words to use. Uh, nations, um, they do have different, uh, a handful of different different constellations, and that's mostly related to the animals that are around them. Um, there would be more to say on this if once we start branching out and talking to more elders, but I think the short answer to it is yes. Yeah. Sean, you have a question? Hi, yes. Um, thank you, Pete. That was an absolutely fascinating uh, presentation. Um, a, a couple of years ago, I was lucky enough to visit uh, Mauna Kea in Hawaii, 
um, uh, obviously a, a site that many amateur astronomers would would like to visit. One of the things I became aware of quite quickly while I was there is that there's been a very long running and at times a very bitter, bitter dispute between native Hawaiians and about the importance and spirituality of Mauna Kea to them as a location. And since the 1960s, the development of, of large scale um, um, optics uh, there and the fact that there's a, a strong feeling that, you know, their culture and their views have been largely disregarded by mm-hmm. the scientific community there. And I've, I've followed with interest as well the debate you're having in Australia at the moment around the, the uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders voice. And I know that your federal government's planning a referendum later this year on how to maybe change the, 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 the Commonwealth Constitution or at least to recognise that. I'm just wondering... In your view, do you think maybe Australia is kind of providing a sort of a guide about how to get this right, or at least how to maybe walk back some of the, dare I say it, Eurocentric damage <laughs> that's <laughs> happened over the generations? Because it strikes me that, um, you know, astronomy, listening to what you said tonight, astronomy is probably one of the oldest sciences we have. I mean, mm-hmm. humans have been looking at the night sky. I think, in fact, some of the oldest mm-hmm. uh, paintings ever, uh, uh, graphic descriptions ever, are you know dating tens of thousands of years of the night sky in caves and in and in places like that. So, I just wonder what your views were on on this kind of development in Australia and how Australia's scientific community is trying to come to terms with with some of these issues. So. Uh... I'm going to try and do this in the most politically neutral way uh, that I can. Um, I think I think it's great that uh, these steps are being taken. I think it's a bit late for it to be done. I mean, particularly when every and when relations with Torres Strait Islanders, Islanders and Indigenous populations um, were pretty awful up until the '90s and even a bit into the '90s, uh, when the government stepped in and issued an apology. We called it Sorry Day to apologize for a general blanket apology as much as you can to all of the um all of the negative things that have happened to these populations but the the science part of it is actually really good to see i mean the the acknowledgments that now happen and the discussion that goes in to uh to hearing indigenous voices to the building of new telescopes like the ska for example um i think this is a very positive thing and Australia is is taking steps in the right in the right direction, and I would like to see this dispute at Mauna Kea, which is you know in my line of work, I hear about it from astronomers' point of view, and and uh, there's a diverse range of opinions uh, from there. But the uni- universally from Australians I talk to uh, talk to about it are all in agreement of hitting that perfect compromise. So we are doing. I think we're taking steps in the right direction. Um, it's always going to be tough uh, to strike that balance, but I'm sure there will be, uh, I think we're seeing steps towards finding that common ground if people can kind of put their ideals aside, particularly, in my opinion, the Eurocentric view, if they can put those aside, would be great. That's great. Thanks very much. Brian, I think uh, you had a comment and question. Yes, um, my sister who lives and her husband who live in Darwin, hmm. Pete, um, they've just cool. recently been over and we were talking quite a lot about, um, Nigel and I have been over several times there and they were talking a lot, Debbie, my sister was talking a lot about um, that one of the really worrying things that's happening is there's a whole generation of, of young Indigenous people who have seem to have lost touch with their heritage and lost touch with that community thing with the elder for lots and lots of reasons which won't go into at the moment but I'm assuming does that mean that from your point of view or the point of view of people who are collecting these stories that, that there's actually quite a, a, a quite a short timeline to get them and get them down before they're forgotten before the elders die or yes. is it not that acute I, it's yes that's a that's a resounding yes and some of the work of Ray comments that there is a need to to try and bridge that to bridge that gap or even try to get the youth indigenous population to kind of reconnect but th- th- this there's the i think uh there's another side to this maybe related a bit to um 
to the youth, but as far as recording um, this, these, these beliefs and these systems to actually put them down onto parchment, um, does rely on the elders who are actually willing to actually talk to mm -hmm. people. Um, the modern, there are like, a lot of the nations are lost, but there are people still out there. But the the damage is so has been so bad that they will not divulge what to them is very important spiritual information about their way of life, the the route the the earth around them, the sky above them, that they're not willing. So there's, I think that's also an interesting, uh, that's also an important problem to overcome. So there definitely is a, I think a, a, probably two sides to this, the youth and the elders that are just, it's it's going, it's it's going to go away and there should be an urgency to bridge the gap so we can at least record for posterity all of these belief systems that have existed for tens of thousands of years. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's all on uh, Zoom, Mark, if you want to hand over to Will. Yeah, Will, is there any, there's a couple of questions I can see on YouTube if you want to ask those. Yeah, yeah excellent. That was a fantastic talk there, uh, Pete. Uh, just before I say the questions, I just, just mentioned in the chat there that uh, your photo you had of, of the comet was the Great Comet of 2007 by Robert right. Nort. And uh, he's actually a Scottish astronomer living in Australia, and um, and he found that comet. And I believe he took that photo as well because I've got a copy of it. But he he's found many minor bodies and um, there's a, a minor planets. And a couple of our few of our eminent astronomers are actually have minor planets named after them from from him. So that's awesome. So people, there's uh, Dr. Dave Gavine and Ron Liversley, and um, we've also Harry Ford, who's an honorary member of our society, has a has a has a minor planet named after him by by Robert Nor to that uh, who who took that photo and found that comment. So That's excellent. awesome. Um, but lots of yeah, it's, it's good uh, reports from YouTube. We've got one um, question from uh, Keith Pearson. Um, basically, is is asking there's it may be an urban myth and uh, pro probably is I would imagine, but you never know. Um, <laughs> talking about ancient rock art that. It's, it, he's heard that some depict Saturn's rings, or is that an urban myth? As far as okay, so I'm going to preface this with I, I'm as far as I'm aware, I have seen artwork that that people have claimed that it depicts it. I believe I've seen this in my research for this talk, um, but I do think you should take that with a grain of salt. Um, I, I think that may just be an urban legend. Um, I don't, this, this, I guess this is my personal view that I doubt that they had good enough eyes to see that. <laughs> um, definitely not the capabilities to make like a telescope to see, but that'd Absolutely. be cool if they did. That would be really cool if that, if that is in fact what they were depicting. Excellent. Yeah. And, um, no, I quite agree with you there, but but one never knows, you know, it's amazing yeah. things um, archaeology um, brings out, you know, it's incredible things that people have done in the past. And we've got uh, another question from Gloria, um, basically asking, what is your favourite story of all from the Dreaming Nations so far? Um, I think I have, I have two I have two for that, um, and I've told both of them tonight. I don't know why, but I find the moon men one so interesting um how they used this idea of this man being chopped up for being greedy uh to explain uh the the uh, the phase of the moon um i just i just find this something poetic in it um but i really like uh the 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 fighting birds and how even in chaos um in darkness when the egg cracked and the light uh shines down and it's a crazy spirit thought actually the world is better in the light i think there's something really nice about that excellent excellent that's great and just just um a final thing just just i kind of thinking i'm quite interested in sort of archaeology and, and, and rock art and i just yeah. wonder what your opinion was do you think there's masses more sort of um, rock art to be found from 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 the ancient from the ancients or do you think um that a lot of it has been you know found and it's just maybe just little periphery bits that would be be found in in the future um i'm trying to look at this from an archaeological point of view and the way that australia is uh at 
present. There's a lot. It's a big desert out there. It's yeah. big. Australia is mostly the the population is mostly on the east coast, so there could be some major discoveries still to be made, and no one's going to go and try and traverse all of that desert to figure it out. But I think uh, if there's going to be a major discovery, you'll be looking over <laughs> in Western Australia where they're mining, and that kind of thing is pops up every now and then. Um, I would like there to be more. It would be really nice that as long as they treat it with respect and conserve it. That's another issue. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Cheers. Well, that's great. Thanks for all your questions. So thank you for answering this, Peter, as well. Uh, can we thank Peter again for, for that fascinating talk? Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. I, I like the sound of your day job as well, Pete, which is um, galactic archaeology. So um, I think <laughs> maybe, assuming that's not just digging through the remnants of the Empire or the Trade Federation, then I think it would be great to have you back maybe in person <laughs> in Edinburgh to talk about that as well sometime, because that sounds really, really good. So that I would be more than happy to talk about my research. I could talk about it for hours. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds really good. Thank you.